go to Matthew chapter 15 this morning. I want to ask you this morning, I'm going to talk to you about a couple things. Does your life reflect Christ in you? You know, we've been uh, discussing vision, what the Lord has done. We've been talking about where we believe He's wanting us to go. You know, there's a lot more I can say about vision, and, and, and you know, maybe someday I will. But, you know, the, the, the thing with vision with some people is, is they struggle with today. And then when you get people that start seeing into, you know, tomorrow or the next day, that really, and then when you start talking to people about six months and a year down, some people just, that, that really messes with people. It got quiet in here. We were just shouting a minute ago. But, but the problem with vision is some people, they, they can't see down the future. They don't want to look down the future. They're just, they're like, Pastor, if you only knew what I was dealing with today. Listen, if you'll get, if you'll get past today, and start seeing what God's wanting to do in your life. If you'll get past today and start looking down the road and say, listen, this is what Jesus saved me for. This is what Jesus healed me for. This is what Jesus called me for. This is what Jesus delivered me for. And we start looking down the road at what God has ordained us to do. He told Jeremiah, he said, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Quit looking at your problems today and look at the kingdom that waits ahead of you. Man, the kingdom is out there. We got people that need Jesus. We need to be looking down the road and we need to be looking about what is our potential and what things can God do in us. Hallelujah. We're getting ready. We just went through Thanksgiving. We're getting ready for Christmas and New Year. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you this morning. Listen, I brought this mirror right here because this is, this is what some of us do. We, we get in this thing right here. Check your hair. Is it good? All right. I checked mine. It was, it's all in place, but all right. We, we, what the problem with, is it, it okay. You know, some of us, I won't put it on you, Miss Debbie, I promise. But some of us, we get in, we get in that, that mirror, and we start focusing on what that mirror says. How do I, how do I look? What's everybody going to think when they see me? We, we, we get so focused on, I said we. I didn't say you. We get so focused on this, but Jesus said that right there has nothing to do with whether you make it into heaven or hell. That right there has nothing to do with your future. This is what has to do with your future. See, we're looking in the wrong mirror. Does, 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 is this what you're lining your life up? Do you spend so much time in this that you don't have time for this. Because this is what's going to change your life. This is what's going to change your destiny. This is the vision that God has for you and I that we need to get a hold of. Look at this. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10 and 11. It says, When He called the multitude to Himself, He said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth defiles a man. Not what goes into his mouth, but what comes out of his mouth is what defiles a man. Father, thank you. Thank you that I'm free. Thank you that I'm born again. Thank you that I'm blood-bought. Thank you that I've been redeemed. Thank you for the greater one that lives inside of me. Thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Thank you for the Holy Ghost and for power. Thank you for the Word of God that is truth and every promise in your Word that is yes and amen to the glory of God. Thank you, Lord, that we've been redeemed. Lord, I rejoice in your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I pray that everything that I say and that everything that I do will bring glory to my King. Lord, it's not my appearance. It's not, it's not how, how nice I dress or how, how good I try to look. Lord, if, if my heart is not right, if what's in me is not right, Lord, change me right now. If there's anything in my life that is not pleasing to you or has priority over you, Lord, I ask you to re- reveal it and remove it right now that my life will be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Jesus right here is responding to the religious crowd that was criticizing him and his disciples because they didn't wash their hands. 
See, it was all about appearance to the religious crowd. Because the disciples didn't wash their hands. So Jesus says, listen, it's not what's going in that's going to defile them. It's what is going to come out of them. It's going to make all the difference. It's not what they look like. It's what they say. It's not their family name or their church name. It's how they respond out in public when everybody else is around and when everybody else is listening. It's how they act in the secret place when no one's around, but God is always listening. Jesus told them it was not what they saw with the natural eye that that should concern them, but what comes out and others hear is what should concern us all. What comes out of our mouth, what other people hear, is what should concern us all. Because what you say will defile you. Look at this. Jesus says this in Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah, Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. This morning, where's your heart? Where's your heart? What comes out of your mouth? What do people really see and hear from you? See, this is, this is the deal. I, I, and I say this all the time. But I really believe one of the biggest reasons why the, the church, not this, this church, I'm talking about the big C church, one of the big reasons that the Christian church is on the decline instead of on the growth, the incline, is because people in society see people that have religious bumper stickers and religious t-shirts and, and all these other things. They see them out and they hear what they say. And they say, if, if they're going to talk like that and they're going to act like that and they're going to talk about somebody that they know that they go to church with like that, then I'm not going to their church. Why do I need to go to church? I can get all of that around my friends in society that don't know Jesus. We need, to, we need to make sure that what we're saying and how we're saying it is reflecting Christ in us. See, if you let gossip, bitterness, anger, slander come out of your mouth, if your actions are not pleasing to God, that's what will defile you. But if you're getting in the Word, and it's the Word that's coming out of you, if the, everything you do in word and deed, that's pleasing to God. See, the more word you get in, why did I start doing scriptures in the morning? Not because I have nothing else to do. I'm just going to be honest with you. My wife and I, we go on vacation sometimes, and she's like, well, you promised to sleep in in the morning. And I try to get up at 6 a.m. and sneak into the bathroom and start sending out texts so all of you can get your scriptures. I did that one time. We went on vacation. It was like 7 o'clock in the morning before I sent out scriptures. I got a couple texts start coming in. Pastor, are you okay? All right, Pastor, are you is everything all right? Do we need to pray? I'm like, hey, I just, I slept in on my vacation. I apologize. They said, we wait for your scripture to come in. That's my alarm clock. I'm like, you better get you another alarm clock. (laughs) But, but I started doing that not because I have nothing else to do, because I know for some people that may be the only word they get that day. Oh, me. We need, to, we need to get in the Word. We need to get the Word inside of us. You will never please every person. Thank you very much. <laughs> I thought I was done right there, sister. Listen, we're never going to please every person, but that's, that's, that's not our goal. Our goal is to please Christ. Our goal is to please the Father. How do I please the Father? By acting like Him here on the earth. By, by being His example. What did I minister to the football team? And I, I've shared some of this here before, but I told them, I said, this is the deal. I said, the sun, while you're out there practicing during the day, the sun is putting off light. But at night when you're out there playing, it's not the sun, it's the, it's the moon that's putting off light. But it's not the, the, the moon that's putting off the light, it's the moon that's reflecting the sun. Put that into spiritual terms. We are a reflection 
of the sun, the S-O-N. And so I challenged those football players. I said, win or lose, how you act, how you respond will reflect what people know. If you act a fool, people are going to think Perry High School is a bunch of foolish people. If you act like an idiot, they're going to think everybody from Perry is an idiot. If you, if you cuss and scream and you start throwing tantrums on the field, they're going to think that that's how your family and everybody around you acts. But if you act like and you talk like you've got some sense and you keep it together, people will respect you win or lose. As a child of God, people are going to decide the relationship with Christ based on those that call themselves Christians. What are you reflecting? What's, what's coming out of your mouth? Our goal is to live and act like Christ. So my question is, does your life reflect Christ in you? Flip over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse number 9. He says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Now, I could take this and, and probably teach on this couple scriptures for, for days, and I'm not going to do that, but there, there are a few words I, wanna, I would like to pull out and share with you. See, I, I believe that unless somebody teaches, unless someone shows you, I, I, I think about when I was a kid growing up, the things that my dad taught me, that I still remember today that I'm able to pass down to my children. The reason that I study, the reason that, I, that, I, that I'm going back and getting my degree, the reason I spend so much time in the Word, the reason I'm doing all those things is not to, to try to elevate myself, it's to, to do what Jesus did and to teach the sheep. I have, to, I have to get more in me so that I can give it to you. Because if you don't ever have someone teach it to you, how are you ever going to learn to live it? All right, I'm going to get the mirror back out because I need someone to amen me. Amen, brother. All right. So look at this. The first word he says, and I've used it twice, is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. The King James Version says dissimulation. But the Greek, the Greek meaning for both is unfeigned, undisguised, or unsincere. The dictionary defines hypocrisy this way. A pretense of having a virtuous character, moral or religious beliefs or principles that one does not really possess. I've probably shared this with you before. The, the way that they got, the Greeks got the word hypocrisy is back in the day before Hollywood, before they had all these actors that were making millions of dollars, they had these people that would put plays on out in the square. They'd be in, in the middle of Rome and they'd be putting on these, these, these performances. Or people would go to the theater and they'd put on these. And a lot of times they would have one actor that would play multiple parts. So the actor would come out and he'd read one line and then he'd grab a mask that was normally on something like a paint stick and he'd put that mask up and he'd say another line. And so the deal was, is, is how they got this, this whole thing about hypocrisy, is it, it's you're, you're, you're saying something but that's not really who you are. You're acting one way, but that's not really who you are. As a, as a child of God, as a Christian, as a born-again believer, as one that is free, do you act like that person? Do you act like somebody that truly possesses Jesus? Do you act like someone that really has Christ in their heart? If not, that is hypocritical. To be a hypocrite is to confess that you are something that you're not and not practice it. You, 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 say that, you say that you're one thing, but you don't act like it. You say that you're one thing, but that's not how you live your life outside of, uh, of your Christian friends. 
You don't work around people that go to church with you, so you don't have to act a certain way. That's hypocritical. And again, the reason that the church is not growing and the reason that people are struggling to get into the local church is because they've seen people that say that they're Christians that don't act like it. So the first question that I have for you out of several questions I want to ask you is, number one, does your behavior reflect Christ in you? Does your behavior reflect Christ in you? With two minutes to go yesterday afternoon in the Iron Bowl, I had probably behavior that was not fitting for, and I'll just leave it right there, but I got right. I got right with God real quick, all right? Matthew 6, 2. Matthew 6, 2 says, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets. They may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. See, for some people, it's, it's easier to be critical to someone upon meeting them than to show them grace. I, I, I don't like to go to the store. I'm not, I don't, I'm, I just don't like to go to the store. But I had to go to Walmart the other day. And, and, and people just, I don't know, I think people sit in their car and they get this stuff in their mind and they're just like, somebody's going to be rude to me, so I'm going to go ahead and get my rude on right now just so I can beat them to the punch. I mean, you just, you're just trying to find a parking spa- space in the, in the parking lot. And boy, if, 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 if you go to pull in and somebody's getting ready to, the, boy, they just, they, they start saying things that I'm like, I don't even hear you, but I know that that's rated R. And they just get mad or you go in and, and you're trying to grab a cart and somebody else, you know, they're gra- I had that cart. And well, hey, you just, just, you just take the cart. You're going down the aisle. trying. I mean, people just get so upset in society. We have to make a decision. Will I act like them or will I act like him? So I have to sit in my truck and I have to get my Jesus on. Lord, before I walk in here, somebody's going to say something, somebody's going to do something, somebody's going to be rude. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to extend grace. So I go walking in, and there's a, there's a lady, you know, they got the, the, the person there at Walmart now that when you walk in, if you got to return something, you got to get a sticker from them and, and all that stuff. And, I, you know, I'm, I don't know how much money they're making, but they're not happy as soon as you walk in the door most of the time. And so I go walking in, the lady's in front of me, and she's got a bunch of stuff she needs to return. And the, and the, the lady's sitting there, she goes, she goes, you need your sticker. She goes, I know I need my sticker. Don't you see me stopping? I'm like, oh, Jesus. So my first thought was, go wide. But then I said, grace. So I paused, slowed down. She gets her sticker, and she turns, and she goes to the customer service. And I walk up, and I said, how are you this morning? She looked at me, she said, good. I said, really? I said, I'm having a great day. She said, well, that's great. I said, man, the sun is shining. I'm alive. Jesus is good. She looked at me. She said, you are having a good day. I said, I am too. I said, I hope you have a great day. She's like, well, thank you. So I went and I did my business. I come walking back out. And again, she's she's standing there checking receipts. And some people are trying to walk by. She's like, I need your receipt. I waited back. I only had two or three items. I waited back and I walked up. I said, ma'am, here's my receipt. I said, you want to see inside my bag? She goes, I remember when you walked in. You're having a good day. I said, I'm having a great day and I want you to have a great day. She grabbed her little marker. She, thank you, sir. I said, happy Thanksgiving. She said, happy Thanksgiving to you too. Now, I, don't, I didn't lead her to Jesus. I didn't get her baptized in the Holy Ghost. I didn't lay hands on her or none of that. But what I did is I extended some grace because nobody else did. How does your behavior reflect Christ in you? A, does your behavior of sincerity towards others reflect Christ in you? I wasn't trying to put on an act. I, wasn't try- I was just trying to say, listen, if I was sitting there for eight hours... I would probably not be in a great mood either. So I want to make sure that my sincerity, the sincerity of my behavior, reflects Christ. Not a mask, not putting on some hypocritical, but being sincere in how I speak to other people. See, I think so many times we're trying to compare ourselves with the wrong people. 
We're trying to, we're, maybe we're trying to, you know, the old expression, we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses is not who I'm worried about. The Jesus is. See, when we start showing compassion towards others, when we start empathizing with other situations and hurts, when we start showing grace and mercy rather than a critical spirit, we represent Christ. The reason, the reason we decided, and, and I had the school call me, I said, Pastor, are you going to be doing uh, gifts for some of our indigent kids? I said, I'll tell you what. I said, if you've got some kids that you just know without a shadow of a doubt are probably not going to get anything, I said, you call me. I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just saying go ahead and call me. I said, but this year we've decided to do something a little bit different. And she said, what are you doing? I said, and I told her about the bags. And she's like, that is amazing. She said, man, she goes, your church is great. She goes, you don't worry about it. She goes, we'll get people to take care of these kids. She goes, you let me know how that turns out. Well, then Thursday morning, Thanksgiving morning, I'm over there at the football team, and I'm sharing, and I'm talking to them about what we're doing. And we got finished, and I, Coach dismissed them, and Coach walked up, and he gave me a big hug. He said, you let me know when you get ready to start distributing those bags. He said, I'm going with you. He said, matter of fact, he said, you call me when you start packing them. He said, I'll come over there and help you pack them. He said, brother, I've never been to your church. He said, but I need to come. He said, but you're about serving. He said, you show up here with water and sweat dripping off your bald head. And he said, you've always got a smile. He said, I call you to come over on Thanksgiving morning and you show up with a smile. He said, then you're telling me that you guys are going to go out at Christmas time and you're going to hand out bags to, to, to homeless people. He said, man, he said, I want to be part of that. It's not an act. It's not some game that I'm playing. It's sincere. I want to be sincere in everything that I do. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, verse 8. He said, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? He's shown it to you. He's, he's put it in His Word. He's taught it to you. I'm trying to teach it to you. Don't take this as, oh my gosh. Really? We're right after Thanksgiving and He's getting on to me? No. Look at it as man. He's teaching me something on how I need to act. I don't want to just blow smoke up your chimney. I want to help you to be a better person. As we draw closer to Christmas, listen, it's not a joyful time of the year anymore. People are out there getting hard and they're getting bitter and they're getting angry and, and our, our politicians just keep on jacking up the prices and people are getting upset. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Act like it. What does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Take every opportunity you have. Man, I'm not saying you got to buy people's stuff. I'm not saying that, 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 I mean, if the Lord tells you to do it, do it. I'm just telling you this. Put a smile on your face. Come with a kind word. Treat people the way you want to be treated. B, does your behavior of humility reflect Christ in you? First, you've got to make sure, does my, is, am I sincere in what I do? But then the second thing is, do I have humility in what I'm doing? See, are you just being kind and, and trying to act humble with, a, uh, with a, an attitude of, again, it goes back to that hypocrisy, or do people truly see Christ in you? See, it seems today that everybody wants to be recognized. And I'm, I'm not going to try to get into this. I'm going to make an announcement before we end today, so make sure you don't leave early. But, you know, the reality is, folks, I want you to hear my heart. It's not about Tim McLaughlin, and it's never been about Tim McLaughlin. It's about Jesus. It's about kingdom. It's about what can we do better to reach more people. What can we do to make sure that we are being sincere and we are being humble in everything that we do to reach more people for the kingdom? It'd be great to have the sanctuary filled, and that's, that's all well and good. But what about all the people that, that maybe we can't get into the sanctuary? What about people out there that, that, that need to hear the truth? I want to I I make sure that I'm not just preaching to you, 
but then I'm living what I'm preaching. Matthew 20, verse 16. Let the last be first and the first last. Many are called, but few are chosen. Let the last be first and the first be last. Jesus showed us that the way, was, uh, the way up was down. The way up is down. The last would be first and the humble would be exalted. See, the problem with the world that we live in today is it doesn't value humility. And in fact, most of the world today avoids it altogether. Yet Christ humbled himself when he gave up what was rightfully his to come to earth and to live as a human. The creator of all became the created and suffered and died for you and I. See, our problem is we think, well, what will they think about me if, if, if I did that? What did they think about him when he was stripped and beaten and crucified? There was a Roman soldier stood there and he said, truly, he is the Son of God. Because he humbled himself, stepped out of heaven, came to earth as a man. He was crucified and he did nothing wrong. Listen, I got enough stuff to be crucified for. I know you all are saints. I'm just telling you, I got some stuff that I'm still working through in my life. I'll probably never be crucified. Probably never be crucified. But that doesn't mean some people don't try to throw stones. That's not, that's not what we're called to do. We need to walk humbly before our brothers and sisters. Christ humbled himself. Humility is the behavior that we should live by. We are not, we are not to live our lives shining brightly for self. We are to live our lives shining brightly for Christ. That's why we get t-shirts printed that say Colossians 3.23, that everything I do, I do as unto the Lord, not as unto man. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. See, listen, I, I've been there. I, I'm sure Pastor Frankie's been there. I, I don't know, if, I, I'm sure Pastor Richard Russell's been there. You know, I don't know how many other ministers we have in the house. But, but, but I, I remember those times when I was an associate pastor or, or maybe, you know, when I was an evangelist for the last 14 years and I would travel someplace and I would preach. And what happened is, is you had a pastor that had been in that pulpit for 10, 15, 20 years, maybe longer, and they heard that pastor every Sunday. And then all of a sudden a new guy steps in the pulpit and he says something, he preaches the same message the pastor just preached. And at the end of the day, people are coming up going, oh, brother, you're great. I wish you were my pastor. And if you're not careful... Pride will get in. And I had to learn early as an evangelist when I would go to churches and people would come to me and say, Brother, I, I wish you were our pastor. Man, that was a great word. I said, you know what? You wouldn't like me as your pastor. <laughs> See, I'm leaving today. I got one good one in me. If I came back next week, you probably wouldn't like that one. So you better love your pastor. And they just kind of look at me. I mean, I, you know, I just I want to make sure that I'm staying humble and deflect all the praise. I thank God that he anointed me to get up there and preach that message today. Without him, I couldn't do anything. I, I, I want to deflect it because I want him to be exalted. Everybody with me this morning? Yes. C, does your behavior of self-control reflect Christ in you? See, are you a person that gets upset easily and flies off the handle? Okay. Or are you a person of self-control? Do others look to you in times of crisis or do they run the other way because they know you're hot-headed? Y'all look at me. I want everybody looking at me. Look at me. Some of y'all are looking at me. I want you to look at me. I apologize because I've been a little hot-headed. Sometimes I and I'm just going to be honest with you, this is not in my sermon, this is not in my notes, this just, it's just, I'm just being transparent to you. Several years ago, uh, I had a, another pastor that falsely accused me of some things. And, and, and I made a statement to that guy that was not of the Lord. 
Now, I wasn't bad. I didn't use any four letters or nothing like that. I just, I just, I told him. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I told him. He, he falsely accused me and my wife of some things. And I told him, I said, brother, I'll whip you. I'll pray for you afterwards, but I'll whip you. That wasn't Christ. And, and, and so what he did is he went and pressed charges against me because he said he was in fear. Now, if you'd have seen this guy, like he was, he was 6'4", 280. I looked at the, 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 the captain or whatever at the sheriff's department. When I walked in, he started laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, the fact that two preachers are, are putting, pressing charges against each other. And he said, I've seen the other guy. And he said, I can't believe that he filed this report. I'd be embarrassed if I was him. But the, but the reality was he was just trying to attack our ministry. And so, anyways, we got it all said and done, dropped the charges, all that stuff was expunged and everything like that. But I had to do some serious soul searching. I had to do some serious heart examining. And I remember I had some guys on my board of directors back then. They said, uh, they said we think you may have some anger issues and you need to go see a psychiatrist. Right? So I go to this psychiatrist. I had five visits. They said, we're going to pay for you to go to this guy. Five visits. So I go to this psychiatrist. And I sit down for five one-hour sessions. The hardest session of them all was the fourth session because that's when they brought my wife in. And he's asking her questions and I couldn't answer and I just had to sit there. Oh, Jesus. They say the truth has set you free, but I don't know if that's what I got. But anyhow. But after five sessions, he typed a letter and he sent it to my board of directors. He said, I don't believe that Tim McLaughlin has anger issues. He said, I believe Tim McLaughlin is so passionate for the things of God that it often comes across as maybe he's angry. Now, I'm not using that for an excuse. I'm just trying to tell you sometimes, I, I get passionate for the things of God. I get passionate. I, I don't like it when things don't work around here. I don't like it when things are broke down around here. I don't like it when lights are flickering when we're trying to have. I don't like it because it distracts other people from hearing the gospel. When Facebook's not working properly and the sound's not working properly and people have all kinds of complaints first thing on Sunday morning, those things get, get aggravating. Jesus himself had a, had a, had a vision. He had a, a, a job that he came to do. And he had to go to the cross. And Peter looked at him. He said, I will not let that happen. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus, do you have anger issues? No, but I came to, to fulfill a task. Proverbs 15, 18 says, A wrathful man stirs up st strife, but he who is slow to anger... A lie's contention. I like how the New Living Translation says I think I got it up there, maybe. Nope, we don't. All right. The New Living Translation, I'll just read it to you. Proverbs 15, 18. It says, a hot-tempered person starts fights. A cool-tempered person stops them. We need to be cool-tempered. There's enough fighting going around. Self-control shows others who you are. Are putting your trust in. Self-control shows others who you are putting your trust in. James chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I'm going to leave that one up there for a second. Because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. He says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. After 20-something years of ministry, I'm still working on it, but I'm going to tell you folks, you need to get a hold of that because people are going to do things that are going to tick you off. Well, you didn't have to say it that way, brother. I mean, I'm just kidding. I raised my hand. He said, that's right. But people are going to do things that are going to tick you off. Choose your words wisely, and the best thing to do is probably not say anything at all until you have time to pray. Boy, I got quiet in here. Let's go to D. Does your behavior of gratitude reflect Christ in you? Are you rude and ungrateful toward others, or do you have an attitude of gratitude? In this day of rudeness, gratitude is misunderstood and often undervalued. Gratitude keeps our minds trained on the fact that without God, we would have nothing Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, people are looking to us to see how we will respond in every situation. There are people at your job, they know you're a Christian, they know where you do what you do on Sunday. 
And when the boss comes in, I, I heard uh, uh, Miss Patricia, Pastor Patricia, talked about this a couple weeks ago. She shared her testimony about how uh, she walked in and a bunch of people were going to get laid off. And she just walked in and she just, she, she just had the joy of the Lord and she had a positive word. And people are like looking at her going, what are you so happy about? Do you know what's going on? She says, my God will supply all of my needs. People are looking to you to see how you're going to respond in every situation. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. Is that the fragrance you're putting off? You ever thought about that? Because again, he could go back to what I started with. What comes out of a man defiles him. What's coming out of you? What's the fragrance that you're putting off around others? See, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. I want to make sure that the fragrance that I'm putting off is leading people to Christ, not driving them away from Second Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3.2 says, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy. He's talking about in the last days. He said, Timothy, in the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Folks, we are living in the last days. I hear the way some young people talk to their parents. I'll just say this, that kid's glad they're not mine. We, we, we've lost respect for elderly people. Man, I, I don't, even when I was in the midst of my mess, when I was unsaved, my dad taught me that you, you, you either call them Mr. or Mrs. Or, or whatever title, if it's a police or if it's a reverend, or you use a title. You don't call somebody, if, if they were normally 10 years or more, older than I was, I always made sure I addressed them with some type of title. I never called them by their name. And if they were younger than me, but they, were, they had a title. The chief of police, every time I talked to him, I called him chief. He said, just, just call me by my name. I said, I did. You're the chief of police. Now, when you decide to retire, maybe I'll decide to call you by your first name. But right now, you are the chief of police. You are the mayor of Perry. You are the coach of the football team. I'm going to call you by a title. Some of you that are in this church that are, have been around me, I've had some, some elderly people say, well, you can just call me this. I said, I will call you Miss or Mr., but I will not call you by your first name. But yet I go out in society and I hear people, how they talk to older folks, how they talk to people in authority, and we have lost all respect The second word I want to share with you is love. And I don't know if I'm going to get through all this today. I really want to. But the English language has butchered the word love. I, I say this often, especially in the South. Because in the South, I mean, you know, everybody loves everybody. Love you, brother. Love you. Hey, brother, love you. We'll see how much you love me when I call you at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, I got a flat tire. Can you come and help me? <laughs> Sorry, who's this? Yeah, where are you at? But, but the, the, the Bible, because the Bible was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, has many different words for love. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, there's actually 28 different definitions for love that we could look at. But I, I just want to look at three quickly this morning. You have eros love, which is the word in the Greek that means sensual love. That's the love between husband and wife, or should be. Then you have phileo love, which is an affectionate love towards a friend or someone with the same interest. So when in the South someone says, love you, that's what they're talking about. It's phileo love. City of Philadelphia, brotherly love, okay? And then the highest form of love is agape love. Agape is the true affection or benevolence. It is to love unselfishly to the point that you would be willing to sacrifice your life. 
Jesus went to the cross in love. I, I, I've, I've, I've shared this with many people that have, uh, they've been studying the Bible a lot longer than I have. Some of them got doctorates in theology. And they always look over in John chapter 20, when Jesus is talking to Peter, and he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And what he asks is, Peter, do you agape me? Are you willing to lay down your life for me? And Peter responds, he says, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you like a brother, man, home team. Jesus waits. He asks him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? Peter looks at him, he's kind of a little discouraged. He's like, well, Lord, I mean, that's, I mean you're God. I'm, I'm not really God. I mean, I, I phileo you. And Jesus waited in the third time. And this is where scholars will miss it. And you can look in a lot of different concordances, and you can check this out. A lot of scholars say, well, what happens next is Jesus came down to Peter's level. And scholars will say that Jesus came down and said, Peter, do you truly phileo me? And Peter said, absolutely, Lord. Praise God, I don't have to agape you. That's not what happened. And any scholar that wants to can call me, and they can come, and they can talk, and we can look it over. But what happens is he says, Peter, do you agape me? And the third time Peter finally got it, he said, yes, Lord, I agape you. And how do you know that, Pastor? Why, what makes you so much smarter? Read the Word. The Word says that he looked at Peter and said, that's good. He said, because they will take you where you don't want to go because it's going to show you how you're going to die. If he just filleted him, he said, Peter, you're, you're not willing to go to the cross. Peter finally got it. He said, Lord, I'll go to the cross. And we know through church history, Peter went to the cross and was crucified upside down. How, how, do you, how does your love reflect Christ in you? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God agape us that He gave us Jesus. Mark 16.15, He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel that we preach is a gospel of unconditional love. It's not a love of color. It's not a love of race. It's not a love of income. It's not a love of statute. It's not a love of position. It is an unconditional love. See, my heart's desire is that we will get a hold of unconditional love. When's, when's the last time you hugged someone that ain't bathed in a couple weeks? When's the last time that you walked up and you, I, I saw this uh, yesterday uh, on one of my news feeds. It showed a, a police officer, and I forgot what, it was in North Carolina. It was a police officer in North Carolina that was driving down the road. He was on his way. He had already called in from his squad car that he was on his way to a lunch break. And as he was driving to the restaurant, he passed by and he saw this, this woman sitting next to a stop sign and he knew that she was homeless. And so as he goes in, he walks into the restaurant, and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord convicted him. He ordered two of what he was getting ready to have, and he said, I'll take it to go. He gets back in his squad car. He drives back two blocks to where the woman was sitting. He gets out of the squad car, and he walks over to the woman. She said, sir, I hadn't done anything wrong. He said, no, ma'am, you haven't. He said, but a lot of other people have. And he said, here. And he handed her the lunch, and then he pulled up a stool, and he sat down next to her, and they sat there and ate lunch together. And a neighbor actually caught it uh, on, on, with their phone and took a picture of it and sent it to the newspaper. And the newspaper contacted them. That's how they find out what happened. When's the last time you were willing to sit down with someone that was less fortunate? The gospel is an unconditional love. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Don't say it. Unless you mean, I would just assume you look at me and say, Pastor, I like you. Sometimes. <laughs> Pastor, you're pretty good. Sometimes. Then you look at me and say, Pastor, I love you. And then you talk about me. And I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about anybody. Don't tell somebody you love them unless you, unless you mean it. See, it's easy to love someone who loves you in return. It's also easy to love the beautiful kind, uh, the lovely people, those that say oh, everything sweet and do things for you. But can you really truly love someone that cannot do anything for you, cannot benefit you in any way? 
Pastor, why, why are you talking about it? Because as we get closer to Christmas, as we get closer to the new year, as we, as we get closer to these things, look at the world around you. I want us to be a church that is showing everybody. Why did we take 80 meals over to the hospital? Not because I want our name to be, oh, that's the greatest church. No, because I want people to know we, we truly love Jesus and we love you too. I don't know if it's Pastor Frank or Miss Jennifer said it in one of the videos. We want to take care of those that take care of us all the time. They got to jump up from their lunch when you come into the emergency room regardless. They got to work on holidays because somebody might get sick regardless. I want to take care of those type of people. I want them to let them know that that church over there is a church that doesn't just talk about it but does it. John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Those without Christ only know conditional love, selfish love, erotic love. But when you show an unworldly love, a love that is sacrificial and without limits, preferences, or condition, others can't help but to see Jesus in you. When people look at you and say, Why are you doing this? Because I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, I love you. But I can't do anything for you. Didn't ask you to. Didn't do it for that. I'm doing it because he died for me, and I didn't deserve it. I, couldn't, I can't do nothing for him, but he gave his all for me. Do you judge before you love? Or do you love first? Do you set conditions upon those that you want to be kindly affectionate to? Or do you love unconditionally as God loved you? Friends, we're living in perilous times. Crime, racism, hatred, addiction, the hearts of many are growing cold. We're the church. What are we going to do? Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are we reflecting Christ's love in us? Are the things that we do reflecting Christ in us? I want to jump to the third point real quick and then I'm going to finish this up. And Mr. Julie, I'm probably not going to get to all these scriptures. But the third word, going back to what we looked at, the first one was hypocrisy. The second one was love. The third one is not really spelled out, but it's lived out. Paul didn't write it, but he lived it. And the third word is serving. In Luke's gospel, Jesus was asked the question, who is my neighbor? In Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37, he answered and he goes through the whole story about the, 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 the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. How many of you heard the story of the Good Samaritan? All right. Most of you have. I'm not going to read this whole thing because for the sake of time. But he's talking about a man who was beaten up and was pretty much left for dead. And he said, here comes a religious man walking down the street and he sees him. He says, oh, let me just go over here and act like I didn't see anything. And then another man comes walking down. And he was a religious man. And he did the same thing. And then all of a sudden, a Samaritan. Now, you've got to put things in perspective. Because this Samaritan was one that normally the Jews didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't want anything to do with the Jews. They considered the Samaritans half-breeds. They considered them unclean. They considered them unholy. But that man was laying there beaten and bruised and dying and nobody else wanted to take care of him. And the Samaritan walks up, puts him on his own donkey, takes him down to a hotel, wraps his bandages, gives him some food, gives him some, some wine, pays his hotel bill and tells the hotel clerk, he says, if there's anything else extra, I'll get it when I come back. That's your neighbor. It's not the guy that lives to the right or to the left of you. It's anybody that you come in contact with. When you see somebody in need, do you do one of these? Now listen, I'm not saying that you got to throw money at everybody. Use wisdom. Listen, I'm one of those guys, I pull up to the stop sign, and I'm holding both hands on the wheel. And there's that guy standing there holding the sign at the stoplight, asking for money. And I'll pull up, and I'll ask the Holy Ghost, Lord, do you want me to give? Because, Lord, if you tell me to give, I'll give. It doesn't really matter. 
If the Lord says give, I'm going to give. Some of those guys, now they may scam you. That's not up to you. If, you. if you hear the Lord say give it, you give it, and it's up to the Lord at that point. If the Lord doesn't prompt you, don't say, well, pastor really preached a condemning message. I better give to this guy. I'm not telling you to do that because I know some of them don't use the money wisely. If you really want to be compassionate and somebody says, well, I'm hungry, go down to the local Burger King, pick up two Whoppers and come back and hand it to them. I've done that before. I've walked up to some guy. I said, hey, I got, I got some, uh, two hamburgers. Well, I'm not really hungry right at the moment. Can you just give me some money? You want the burgers or don't you? But at least we're going to walk in love. At least we're going to give people the opportunity. At least we're going to serve people. Does your service reflect Christ in you? We've got to make a decision. How are, we going to, how are we going to act towards others outside of this church and everything that we do? Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. says, so when, when we were without... When we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9 says, Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We have been given the gift of salvation through God, through his love, and through Jesus Christ's sacrificial death. And much more than that, we have been reconciled and made a part of his family. We have been forgiven, restored, and redeemed, and we are called to do the same. Pastor Frank. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to finish this up. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Through 21. It says, Bless those who persecute you. Y'all, you might want to turn over here. This would be a good place to turn and to end with. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Everybody say this with me. Say, Bless. And do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I want to leave you with these four things. Bless all, friend or foe. Rejoice, weep, whether your issue or not, do it for others. Don't try to get even, but walk in love. And give as the Lord has given to you. My prayer is that you'll think about this. Maybe go back and watch it or re-listen to it. Maybe you took good notes. And my heart's desire is this. This holiday season. Don't say Merry Christmas unless you have Christ living in you. And if that be the case, act like it. And I don't mean that ugly. I'm not trying to end on a bad note. I'm just trying to tell us, it's time for the church to arise. We need to be Christ in society. We need to be Christ to our family. We need to live like Christ.
Don't, don't be a hypocrite. Don't show up on church on Sunday, lift your hands, come down to the altar and all that, and then turn around and treat others terrible. It's not always about money. I know money's tight right now. I'm not, I'm not asking you to give all your money to everything. But you can give a kind word. You can give a hand up sometimes instead of a hand out. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus. I don't know how many times I walk through Walmart and I just, man, I'll see somebody and I'll just walk up and say, hey, can, can I pray for you? I've prayed for cashiers. I've prayed for customers. I, I just, man, they need the prayer. I need the practice. Let's pray for people. Let's give a kind word to people. Let's pre- let, let us tell other people how much Jesus truly loves them. Amen.